You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Okay, so uh, as described earlier in uh, the first presentation of this course, the racialization process created a population that was in a disadvantaged position. And the black communities in the United States faced the four-part process of social racial discrimination, of educational deprivation, political disfranchisement, and economic marginality. So again, acute disillusionment robs life of its meaning, and so a new system of explanation and rationale for action must be created self-consciously. Any community facing prejudice, discrimination, segregation, responds in a variety of manners to which, by which to survive the racialization process. There are those who assimilate, there are those who accommodate, and there are those who resist. So we're gonna take a look at movements for change within the black community that followed the three different paths. We'll take a look at those who assimilated, those who accommodated, and those who resisted. Because in this way, we can appreciate how communities are diverse in their responses to change. So let's start with assimilation. Let's start with Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute. Now, Booker Taliaferro Washington was an American political leader, was an educator, an orator, an author. He was a dominant figure in the African-American community in the United States from 1890 to 1915, and he represented the last generation of black leaders born in slavery. He was speaking for those blacks who had remained in the New South in an exploitative, racist environment with the white Southerners. So Washington was able throughout, his 25, throughout the final 25 years of his life to maintain his standing as a major black leader because of the sponsorship by powerful whites, substantial support within the black community, and his ability to raise educational funds from both groups. But most importantly, Booker T. Washington was known for his accommodation to the social realities of the age of segregation and the black codes. Washington re received national prominence for his Atlanta Address of 1895. It is known as the Atlanta Compromise. And he attracted the attention of politicians and the public as a popular spokesperson for African-American citizens. Washington built a nationwide network of supporters in many black communities, with black ministers, educators, and businessmen composing his core enthusiasts. Now, his Atlanta Compromise speech was accepted. Um, ex uh, his Atlanta Compromise speech accepted segregation as long as economic development would be allowed particularly in agriculture and the black communities. He argued that blacks and whites should be separate. If one resisted the apartheid system, of course, the result would be lynching. So Booker T. Washington very clearly uh, uh, understood that to oppose the black codes would mean death. Yet he understood that white supremacy would at least allow blacks some kind of economic independence. Let's take a look at a film clip that addresses the importance of Booker T. Washington. Without question, Booker T. Washington was the single most well-known African-American of his time and may have been the most celebrated black person in the entire world. Future educator and orator, Booker T. Washington was born a slave on a Virginia plantation on April 5, 1856. He had to work as a young child, and so he had to juggle hours walking miles and miles to school and then rush back to work. It was very difficult, but he was determined, and that's how he learned to read and write. Washington was allowed to attend school while working as a servant. And in 1872, he befriended the founder of Hampton Institute, who offered him a scholarship to the school. The emphasis at school was on industrial education, on crafts, on technical skills, teaching blacks and the former slaves how to make themselves valuable to the community in a very literal way. Washington taught at Hampton before being appointed by General Samuel Armstrong to head the newly formed institute in Tuskegee in 1881. This was a groundbreaking endeavor because Armstrong trusted this young man to go to Alabama and create something basically out of nothing. During the post-Reconstruction period, tensions between African Americans and Southern whites were at a fever pitch. But as evidence of racial progress, Washington was asked to address a predominantly white audience at the 1895 Atlanta Expo. 
The speech turned Washington into a national figure. The Atlanta Compromise speech is viewed as controversial because he essentially said that politics was for mainstream society and the thing for African Americans was to be separate as the fingers on our hand and not involve ourselves with white society. Booker T. Washington saw that as a bargain that he had to strike. Those who disagreed with him felt that he had conceded far, far too much to the conservative white South. In 1900, Washington formed the National Negro Business League to promote the economic development of African Americans. One year later, he chronicled his life in the autobiography, Up From Slavery. Booker T. Washington's autobiography was one of the most influential books published by an African American at the turn of the century. Washington urged African Americans to accept their unequal position in society while secretly funding litigation for civil rights cases. In 1905, however, leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois renounced Washington's philosophy and insisted upon full civil rights for all African Americans. There were people during Washington's time, and even now, who were very critical of Washington's racial politics. Washington was willing to trade political and voting rights for economic rights. And Du Bois and others said, that's too hard a bargain. Washington remained principal of Tuskegee and wrote a total of 14 books before his death on November 14, 1915. He was buried on the campus of Tuskegee University. Okay, that's Booker T. Washington. Now let's go to another important movement for change in America that was led by W.B. Du Bois. William Edward Burghardt Du Bois was an American civil rights activist, pan-Africanist, sociologist, historian, author, and editor. Historian David Learning Lewis wrote, in the course of his long turbulent career, W.E.B. Du Bois attempted virtually every possible solution to the problem of 20th century racism. Scholarship, propaganda, integration, national self-determination, human rights, cultural and economic separatism, politics, international communism, expatriation, third world solidarity. He was the first African-American graduate of Harvard University where he earned his PhD in history. Du Bois later became a professor of history and economics at Atlanta University. He became the head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in 1910, and he became founder and editor of the NAACP's journal, The Crisis. Du Bois rose to national attention in his opposition to Booker T. Washington's ideas of social integration between whites and blacks. He campaigned instead for increased political representation for blacks in order to guarantee civil rights, and he advocated for the formation of an African-American elite that would work for the progress of the community. Du Bois came to the forefront in opposition to segregation and he disavowed Booker T. Washington's compromise. He asserted Frederick Douglass's militancy and he used the law to achieve racial equality. Through the actions of the NAACP, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional Oklahoma's grandfather clause in the state constitution. Oklahoma insisted when it became a state that any black person who had grandparents as slaves did not enjoy the right to vote. The NAACP, under the leadership of Du Bois, sought to create or destroy, I'm sorry, to destroy a caste system based on race to get full class rights. Let's go to a film clip on W.B. Du Bois. William Edward Burghardt Du Bois, later known as W.E.B. Du Bois, was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, on February 23, 1868. As a young man, Du Bois received a B.A. from Fisk University before becoming the first African American to earn a Ph.D. from Harvard in 1895. What is impressive about W.E.B. Du Bois, when he went to Harvard, they wouldn't accept his four-year Fisk degree. Du Bois also faced the problem of not being allowed to stay on the Harvard campus after 6 p.m. So if you put it in context historically, it was a great feat. While teaching at Atlanta University, Du Bois produced a number of academic works, including The Philadelphia Negro in 1899, the first case study of a black community in the United States. Du Bois went 
into these blighted areas. He found a population that had terrible health issues. A lot of social ills such as poverty, high infant mortality, prostitution. He didn't entirely excuse the African-American population, but in his analysis, he was very forceful about pointing out racism as a reason for a lot of these ills. Both Du Bois and Booker T. Washington emerged as advocates of their race. However, as an alternative voice to Washington's book, Up From Slavery, Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk in 1903. It was an absolutely unique book. It contains poetry, autobiographical sketches, historical articles, memoir, a wide-ranging representation of the diversity of black experience. In 1905, Du Bois founded the Niagara Movement, opposing Booker T. Washington's racial accommodation theory. The organization became the forerunner of the NAACP, and years later, Du Bois was appointed editor of the NAACP magazine, The Crisis. Du Bois wanted The Crisis to have two main components, protest on the one hand and uplift on the other. At the same time that he was protesting, lynching, and race riots, he was building a consciousness. While continuing his work for civil rights, Du Bois published his first novel, The Quest of the Silver Fleets, in 1911. Four years later, he published The Negro, the first general history of black Africans. He was one of the early scholars who felt like you could not understand the status and condition of blacks in the United States unless you came to terms with the status and condition of Africa. In 1920, Du Bois published the first of his three autobiographies entitled Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil. Then in 1935, Du Bois published his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction in America. With his three autobiographies, and in a sense you could say his body of work, Du Bois gave us a document of what it was like to be black in the American century. While becoming more influenced by communism, Du Bois made a losing bid for the New York State Senate at the age of 82. By 1961, Du Bois joined the Communist Party and moved to Ghana, where he died on August 27, 1963. W.E.B. Du Bois can be deemed arguably the most profound African-American intellectual of his generation. His ideas are still highly relevant for the present generation of scholars. Okay, so let's understand what it means to be black in America. Why do we have a movement called Black Lives Matter? All right. Well, let's look at the Great Migration, and perhaps we can find an answer in the historical anxiety that Americans express towards blackness and the involuntary immigrant in general. Now, up to 1920, the Great Migration characterized the black experience in the U.S. There are migrations from the Civil War on through the 1880s. Blacks do migrate from the South to the, uh, after the Civil War to northern cities. Some people move to Oklahoma, where they form entire towns, Enid, Oklahoma. A significant few arrive here in Los Angeles, uh, where they moved into abandoned Mexican railroad camps, which today form the communities known as Watts and Compton. But before 1914, the percentage of blacks outside of the South is relatively small. Blacks are not included in the growth of industry since white European workers filled the void. Rather, as Africans, they were limited to service sector jobs such as waiters and domestic servants. So the economic demand for labor in the North does not attract uh, blacks to leave the South after the Civil War. Now, by 1914, uh, though the change in the economic capacity to generate jobs in the urban north becomes the primary reason for blacks to migrate from the south. World War I created jobs. The rapid expansion of textiles uh, for uniforms, the growth of the steel industry for airplanes and ammunition, and the war industry needed workers. Well, why black workers? Well, first, white males are being recruited to fight the war. Four million were forced to enlist. Furthermore, the industrial labor force which was predominantly European at the time, was stymied. When World War I broke out in Europe, Europeans stopped coming to America. And since the labor supply to increase production is the constant in capitalism, especially during war, there was a need for infusion of labor forces from the South. Advertisements proliferated in the South, recruiting black males specifically for wartime jobs. 
And this recruitment led to the historical experience known as the Great Migration. Now, America has a need to create social control when they perceive racial imbalance. Let's understand this process clearly. Let's go take a look at this map here. And let's bring this map up and let's understand this Great Migration. Now, when black people start moving up into the north and over to the west, and when they, they do not look like the same people that are of the community. So you think about, again, let's understand the need for social control when there is racial imbalance. Let's understand this process clearly. When too many people who do not look like you take over your community, you react, right? I mean, there's a new people coming in. They don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they definitely cook food different than you. So as an American, you demand that they conform to your standards or else, right? Now, this is the nativist expression. So you want to implement methods of social control to make sure that the incoming population recognizes boundaries of acceptance. So you see methods of social control can be applied to any group in any society. Now, one of the reasons why the Ku Klux Klan is going to gain national recognition in 1915, meaning that they had organized chapters in every state of the Union by then, that they move into the North, was that they were organized to make sure that nativism guaranteed white supremacy. The nativism, the nativist character, was spurred on by the KKK to guarantee white privilege. So let's talk about lynching. Why do Southern whites like to make it a holiday occasion to see a black man hanging from a tree? Why do they come out in mass to see a Negro lynched? Now, in the South, after 1865, lynchings became dramatic. In 1889, the Negro Yearbook, kept by the Tuskegee Institute, kept track of lynchings. They recorded 3,700 that year. The peak came in the 1890s when the lynching was recorded every day in a southern state. Lynchings were directed towards the entrepreneurial leadership in the black community. That's why Booker T. Washington came out with the Atlanta Compromise. The southern white politician liked Booker T. Washington because he didn't protest the hanging of a black man. Economic competition is a major source of violence directed towards the unwanted elements in the community. So students, please remember these images of black tarred and feathered when we journey down the road towards appreciating the undocumented worker today. Let's go to a documentary on lynching. James Allen has collected a photographic record of racial violence in the South. For the past 20 years, he's found horrifying pictures in the family albums of ordinary southern homes. Many are postcards that were mass-produced as souvenirs. Some of these images were printed in the tens of thousands and sold for a dime or a dollar apiece. Some of the postcards tell you where to write and the discount you'll get if you buy one, ten, or a hundred. They were sold in drugstores and pharmacies. They were sold on the street. I purchased a photograph from a woman. The photographer sold them door to door. Her mother bought the image for two bucks. is of particular interest to me was of a 17-year-old boy by the name of Jess Washington in Waco, Texas in 1916. He was seriously mentally challenged. The wife of the farmer that he worked for was found dead. He was arrested. He was brought to trial. The trial took from 10 until 12. And when the jury came back at noon, and found him guilty. Someone in the courtroom, and it could have been, would have been anyone in the courtroom, screamed out, get that nigger. And one of the worst and cruelest treatments of a human being began. Jess was kicked down out of the courthouse, down the back steps where a crowd of several hundred was waiting for him. 
They put a chain on his neck. There were 16,000 people crowding the street to watch this boy be tortured. Jess was tied to the chain over a branch of a tree. The fire was started. They raised Jess from the fire up into the air so that the crowd could see him. There were cheers, like at a football game, cheering the torturers on. When Jess tried to climb up the chain, hand by hand, they cut his fingers off one by one so that all he could do was slap the chain. They lowered him back down in the fire. A man came up and castrated him. Another man kept a pole so that he couldn't crawl out of the fire. And time and again, they pulled him up to keep him from dying so that the crowd could be satisfied until he finally died. Laws passed in the states to end this practice could not be enforced. That's why W.D. Boys and the NAACP increased their attempts to pass federal legislation to outlaw lynching. And there's a long history of violence in the South. Arizona today is just reflecting this heritage. <laughs> 